so far. <coughs> okay. Um, if there should should something should be happening right at the moment, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Now let's get to the fun stuff. Now we can finally start, or I can finally start, um, with our introduction to literary studies. And I think last week we sort of really abruptly ended off with looking at the excerpt of not South Pacific, but of Harry Potter. That was this one, and I asked you to go through this excerpt just to kind of check, you know, all the, um, the smallest parts of what is a story actually about. So just look at the events, the characters, the temporal framing, et cetera, et cetera. And that is what we did, and I think I did sum it up very briefly. We did look at the events, what is happening in this excerpt, what is happening in this very brief overview, um, that is time has passed, Harry's asleep, et cetera, et cetera. We also looked at the spatial setting, which is a middle-class home that is described in various detail um, from the uh, picture frames to where it is situated, so we are still at Privet Drive in this case. The temporal setting is somewhere in the 1990s, and the characters are Petunia, Mr. Dursley, um, Dudley, as well as Harry. So this is what we sort of left off with, and I think I started off to say, you know what, Harry is a round character. We know far more about Harry than we know, at this point in time at least, about Petunia, Dudley, or uh, Mr. Dursley, or Vernon Dursley. So while Harry is a round character, namely that the narrator goes into much depth on Harry, on his feelings, on what he thinks, what he sees, what he feels, etc., etc., this is not so much the case with Petunia, Dudley, and Vernon. They are very much flat characters on, about whom not much is known, and we need to go through the entire sort of story to figure out what these three characters are actually about. And even then, they remain to a certain extent types. Um, and I think my other example was Umbridge. Umbridge is a very flat character. It's simply a type. There is nothing more to her than just being a bully and a pretty bad teacher, whereas Harry is, of course, as well as Hermione or Ron, are uh, characterized in far more depth than other characters we see, in particular in the first three books, by the way. Okay, but... Moving on, and I'm going to go into a bit more depth on characterization, because how do we characterize, or how can characters be characterized? And these two terms will crop up in the next 15 minutes to an unholy degree, so bear with me on that front. So there, in general, there are two ways of uh, I'm going to go through in the following. So looking at explicit characterization, we don't find that in, um, in this excerpt. This is mostly implicit characterization, which I'll go back to in a second. So, but if we talk about explicit characterization, we, for instance, ha can have a look at the opening lines of Emma, Jane Austen's Emma, in which Emma Woodhouse is described as such. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. This is an explicit characterization by the narrator. Not only is Emma sort of characterized by having a name in the sense of her name is explicitly referred to, but her character is roughly described as I mean, handsome is not a character trait necessarily, but a trait of the individual. But generally, she's clever, rich, with a comfortable home, etc. And there is very little to vex her, which, if you know the novel, is kind of not necessarily the case. But this is explicit characterization by a narrator. If that was, for instance, done by Emma herself, who, told, uh, who basically goes, my name is Emma Woodhouse, I am handsome, clever, rich. That doesn't only sound a bit obnoxious, but generally that would be a self-characterization or a characterization by character itself. So this is explicit. We know much, or at least we know a little about the character explicitly. Um, there's also usually that kind of switches in a narrative. There's not just explicit characterization, so novels usually don't focus on one particular kind, but that might switch in between. So some characters might be explicitly characterized, some of them might be implicitly characterized. Um, implicitly, very briefly, is what we see when we look, for instance, at Harry to a certain degree, or if we look at Petunia in this excerpt, we don't, there is no description of Petunia being. I don't know, obnoxious, angry, et cetera, et cetera. But what we see is an implicit characterization by dialogue, for instance. However, 
in this case, I'll, I'll come back to the implicit characterization, but I'm going to switch very briefly to explicit and implicit in one particular excerpt, and this is from uh, Charles Dickens' Bleak House, in which Mr. and Mrs. Snagsby are characterized. In this case, Mr. Snagsby is characterized as a mild, uh, bold, timid man with a shining head and scrubby clump of black hair sticking up at the back of it. This is explicit. Um, however, when it comes to Mrs. Snagsby, the characterization is far more obvious because as the excerpt starts, Mr. and Mrs. Snagsby are not only one bone and one flesh, but to the neighbors thinking, one voice too. That voice, appearing to proceed from Mrs. Snagsby alone, is heard in Cook's court very often. So in this case, Mr. Snagsby might be very mild, but his wife certainly isn't. She is loud, she's boisterous, she's obnoxious, and her voice is the one that is being heard. So we kind of have an implicit characterization of both characters to a certain degree, because while he, he is mild, he is also sort of downtrodden by his wife, while his wife is obviously the more dominant partner in this relationship. Um, so again, this is both at the same time with various characters, and we'll go back to the, one of these kinds of examples in a moment. Um, Looking at, at implicit or explicit self-characterization in this case, we have, and this is something I've sort of briefly referred to when I talked about Emma Woodhouse, if it was, to, you know, if it was written from a first-person narrative perspective, um, that would be a self-characterization. As another example, this is from uh, Wilkie Collins, that is Moonstone, in which the, one of the main female characters sort of characterizes herself um, when she says that I'm indebted to my dear parents, and then she says, I was taught to keep my hair tidy at all hours of the day and night, and to fold up every article of my clothing carefully in the same order, on the same chair, in the same place, at the foot of the bed before retiring to rest. And later on in this excerpt, she says, as an affectionate well-wisher and friend, I proceeded, and as one long accustomed to arouse, convince, prepare, enlighten, and fortify others, permit me to take the most pardonable of all liberties is the liberty of composing your mind. Um, in this case, again, we have an explicit characterization by I am very orderly, by sort of showing you or telling you about my routine. This um, characterizes the main character in this case as being orderly, very routinized, etc. But she also explicitly characterizes herself in the um, sort of later, later stages of this excerpt by saying, you know, um, she is accustomed to arouse, convince, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which also, I mean, the thing is with characterization, because that seems to be a bit vague, because it does both implicitly and explicitly characterizing, we, cannot, we can ver very rarely pinpoint whether it's explicit or implicit, because often an explicit uh, characterization also implicitly tells us something about the character. So when, in this case, Mrs. Clack says, um, as long accustomed to arouse and as an affectionate well-wisher uh, and friend, permit me to take the most um, pardonable of all liberties. That usually sounds very well-meaning, but <coughs> implicitly that tells us quite uh, something about the character herself, namely that she's kind of obnoxious and sort of um, kind of imposes her own thinking and mind upon others. So while she might characterize herself as well-meaning, this sort of fortifying others' minds and sort of composing your mind, someone else's mind, is of course implicitly showing that she is not just well-meaning, but certainly thinks she knows best. There are also other forms of characterization. I'm just going to give you the example. Um, I did refer to Hard Times before. That is uh, Dickens' Hard Times, and that is Thomas Gradgrind. This is a block characterization in which Thomas Gradgrind's... Uh, she's not... Uh, he, she, what? Thomas Gradgrind, definitely is she. Um, where he is certainly characterized not only in a particular way, namely, you know, the, the syntax is very very um, easy to follow, very abrupt in some form. So um, Dickens writes, Thomas Gregg sir, a man of realities, a man of fact and calculations, a man who proceeds upon the principle that two and two are four and nothing over, and who's not to be talked into allowing anything over. So what this block char characterization does is it reproduces the sort of mind and thought style of Thomas Gradgrind while describing him to a certain degree. So he is a man of mathematics. He's a man of calculations. He is a man who knows facts. So if you remember the excerpt from 
I don't know, three sessions ago, I think, where it's facts, facts, facts that are important. This is sort of in some form reproduced in this block characterization of Thomas Gradgrind. Um, which brings us sort of to the implicit way of framing and characterizing characters. And I said that before, that's usually done through showing or telling. And I do have, again, um, an, an example for kind of both. So showing and telling, um, I think that is if you ever watched any sort of video essay on any movie during the last 10 years, what most of these reviewers and essayists and critics will say that this movie tells us rather than shows us. There's the t uh, show don't tell principle when it comes to movies, when it comes to drama, when it comes to sort of performance art in general. So what that means is that showing in this case is the so-called dramatic method. You show a character by having him or her being engaged in a dialogue or by him or her doing something. So um, if you know the book Save the Cat, that's from one of the alien movies in which the main character saves the cat from an, an, not quite an alien invasion, but certainly from certain death. And this saving the cat, simply this action of doing it implicitly characterizes the character herself. So she would go back to, for instance, a burning house, save the cat, and then get out. So by saving something that is considered to be incredibly innocent, her moral fortification, so to speak, is outlined to the viewer without saying, you know, she's a morally upright person. She goes back to a burning house and saves the cat. That is, That would be telling. But in this case, the movie shows us and we can infer from her actions what kind of character she is, what kind of moral stance, for instance, she has. <laughs> so showing, again, is the dramatic method, which is usually something that is said to be a much better way of framing characters than instead of simply you know, showing or telling us what the character is about. So instead of having Emma Woodhouse say uh, or de describe her by a voice over narration as clever, handsome, etc., etc., it would actually, a movie would show her to be just that. Um, which brings us, or kind of the, the next example, I believe, is again from Austen. That is one of the first lines of Pride and Prejudice in which um, we are not really told about the characters as of yet, but we are shown how they um, behave with one another. So if you just look at the excerpt, um, Mrs. Bennet starts with, my dear Mr. Bennet, said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfeld Park is let at last? Mr. Bennet replied that he had not. But it is, returned she, for Mrs. Long has just been there, and she told me all about it. Mr. Bennett made no answer. Do you want to know who has taken it, cried his wife uh, impatiently. Do you want to tell me, and I, uh, do you want to, sorry, you want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. This was invitation enough. Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England that he came down on Monday in a chase and fought to see the place and was much delighted with it. And he agreed that uh, with Ms. Mr. Morris immediately that he is to take possession before Michelmas and some of his servants uh, to be in the house by the end of next week. What is his name? Bingley. Oh, is, uh, is he married or single? Oh, single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune. Four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? How does it affect them? My dear Mr. Bennett, replied his wife, how can you be so tiresome? You must know I'm thinking of marrying one of them. So in this case, Mrs. Bennett is implicitly characterized to a certain degree. She is talking a lot. She is very much concerned with marrying off her daughters. She's not much concerned with anything else but gossip. So later on, um, the narrator describes her as being of simple mind. And this is um, without, and these, these are the first lines of the book. So you immediately know what, what kind of person you are dealing with, with someone who is, again, a little obnoxious, very concerned with matters and the behaviors of others, and someone who is very much concerned with actually marrying off her daughters to not only some guy, but someone who has or is of large fortune. Again, this text also characterizes Mr. Bennett, who doesn't really much care for it. He doesn't reply. Um, his dialogue lines are very, very brief. And for the first couple of lines, the only thing that characterizes Mr. Bennett is that 
he makes no answer whatsoever before he very quickly and very briefly replies. So this is, again, implicit characterization by simply showing us how the characters behave. And we can glean quite a number of things from this excerpt already. However, telling would be, again, simply that the narrator sort of authoritatively intervenes and gives us and outlines one character's character um, and personality in a very brief line, for instance, or even in longish lines. So moving on from this particular excerpt, uh, we are sticking with, with Pride and Prejudice, where um, the author, not the author, oh my god, the narrator explicitly tells us what Mr. and Mrs. Bennett are all about. So Mr. Bennett was an odd mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humor, reserve, and caprice, that the experience of three and twenty years had been insufficient to make his wife understand his char uh, character. Her mind was less difficult to develop. She was a woman of mean understanding, little information, and uncertain temper. When she was discontent, she fancied herself nervous. The business of her life was to get her daughters married. Its solace was visiting and news. This is something we technically, from the first lines, would not have needed simply because showing us how they behave already characterizes them as such. But in this case, it's kind of a conclusion. Just in case you didn't get it from the first couple of lines, this is where the narrator says, by the way, this is how they are, and this is how they will stay throughout the entire narrative. So the only character, again, these are pretty much flat characters, the only character who will eventually develop to a certain degree, or to a certain degree, is Elizabeth Bennet during the narrative. Um, there is also a characterization that is kind of both at the same time, in the sense of where a character describes another character, but also the narrator describes a character, either implicitly or explicitly, that is when we talk about free indirect discourse, which is also often called the dual voice, where narrator and characters, um, characterizations and descriptions usually merge. Um, again, something you find quite often in Austen's novels, so sometimes she's credited as being the first to use it, but generally um, this is one of the other excerpts where Elizabeth is characterized and she um, characterizes others and uh, characterizes herself. Anyway, but I'm going to come back to the free indirect discourse and all of that um, later on. Um, let me just check what's on the next slide because I seem to... Oh, no. Um, talking about uh, characterization and characters in general and narrators in general, and I said that, you know, basically in each and every session that we need to be very critical of characterizations of um, these kinds of, of issues and of characters and of narrators because not all of them are reliable. If we sort of, and I hope that's on the next slide, which it is potentially not, oh yeah. Um, this is the one, so this is um, one of the excerpts I've shown before, and I have already referenced this last part. As an affectionate well-wisher and friend, etc., etc., it is questionable whether Miss Clack, in this case, in this excerpt, is actually a reliable characterizer or someone who can reliably characterize others. If she sort of is implicitly characterized as obnoxious and she calls herself a well-wisher and well-meaning friend and as affectionate, it is certainly not quite, you know, it's not maybe not quite the case or we need to be at least critical of how she describes others and how she describes herself. Um, and that goes on later on in this excerpt or in this book when she um, characterizes Rachel, one of the other uh, female main characters, where she calls her, um, and that's in, in the second line, how can it be that so insignificant looking a person should be the child of such distinguished parents as Sir John and Lady Verinda. On this occasion, however, she not only disappointed, she, re uh, she really shocked me. There was an absence of an all ladylike restraint in her language and manner. And simply because we have already at this point known that Mrs. Clack, or Miss Clack is pretty much, you know, a very Mrs. Bennet kind of type, just a lot less likable, we know that her characterization is not necessarily a reliable one. So her characterization of Rachel as an insignificantly looking woman is actually in favor of Rachel rather than in favor of Miss Clack. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay, yes. <laughs> 
Um, Um, to a certain degree, um, dual voice just means that really two people are speaking, so to speak. So that's a lot of speaking. So the narrator characterizes people by, for instance, um, telling us about them or showing them be engaged in certain activities. So um, just as an example, you have a story told from the perspective of a murderer and that person is currently chopping up a corpse and the narrator says you know he's chopping up a corpse and he is really angry and his face is in a frown but that character would then think about himself you know I'm actually a very affectionate person that would be it's a crass example but it shows that the character characterizes him or herself as a certain person well-meaning nice gentle but the narrator characterizes the character I Oh, that's a lot of characterization. It's a lot of character in this case. Um, the narrator would then describe the character very differently. So this is a very crass example. But again, we'll get back to that um, because every time we talk about narrators and focalization, we'll get back to dual voice and free, free indirect discourse, so to speak. Okay. There was okay. So that. Any other questions? Telling is usually pretty explicit um, in the sense of the narrator tells us in ve very explicitly um, what characters are like, while implicitly uh, usually can mean showing. Implicit characterization is usually done through um, the way characters behave, the way characters talk with each other, the way characters relate to one another. So that is most of the time implicitly. In fact, I don't know an example where it isn't. So there might be some, um, but I can't think of one. Okay. Any other? If that's not the case, I'm just um, giving you, there is a you know, too long didn't read or too long didn't listen slide as per usual where I sort of um, give you an overview over how does characterization work, who characterizes whom, is it explicit, implicit, etc., etc. But I'm not going to go into detail. Again, these are just kind of summary slides that I'm including. Which brings us back to this overview. So what we've done for, um, well, the past couple of minutes and for the past, you know, session or parts of the session is we sort of looked at the story. So what is told, what are the equal and individual parts of the story, the events and the existence in the sense of character setting, etc., etc. Which kind of brings us to not what is told, but how it is told. And again, I need to stress that I don't like the word discourse in this case, but we're going to roll with it, unfortunately, because it's one of the terms that is often being used. So the question is, how is a story being told? Well, in many ways. And as you can see, and uh, if, if you know my time management, you already know that we'll probably manage about half of that today. So um, we're going to start with the easy part with plot and layout, and then we're going to move on to the parts everyone kind of likes and everyone kind of gets confused. That is narration, narrative situation, focalization, um, and then it gets easier with time. Ha, no pun intended in this case. Okay, we're starting with layout. Layout is very, very simple. It is basically all the paratexts that are attached to one narrative. So if you were, for instance, to read Moby Dick in this case, you would open the book and the first thing you see is not only the title page, which is here on, the, on my right, um, where it says, you know, it's Moby Dick, The Whale, by Herman Mel Melville, um, as well as the publishing house, etc., etc. So these are all the info you need in order to get into the story. That's one of the paratexts. Another one would be that we have a number of quotes about whales. So it's, I think, nearly eight pages where, from various sources, Herman Melville compiles quotes that have something to do with whales, which I appreciate, but a reader might not. So many readers might even glance over these paratexts, but they certainly help to set the scene. They also might help to actually get you not only into the story, but also to give you a immediate initial framing of the story. So layout is everything that is, well, 
kind of what it says on the tin, everything that is layout related. Is it in a certain shape? Does it have paragraphs? Does it have stances? Does it have paratexts attached to the narrative? Is it, that's the book cover, it's the title page, it's um, a foreword, it's the structure, et cetera, et cetera. So everything to do with what a, what a story kind of looks like and the paratexts that are attached to the narrative. Um, again, that is usually not necessarily something we um, focus on much in this case, which is why we're moving on with plot. Um, so yeah, so plot is again um, there is a distinct or a, a distinction between plot and story. While the story is the events that happen in a you know in a narrative, this happened. You know, Harry wakes up, Petunia. Um, does this, this, the other. That is just the sequence of events. But plot is about the inherent logic of it. So event one happens, and then event two happens because event one happened. So Harry wakes up in his cupboard because Voldemort has killed his parents. So there is a certain logic to the narration and a certain logic to the events that are happening, whether it's a spatial or a temporal logic or simply a development, that doesn't matter, but it's the inherent logic and structure of plot events, how they are tied together, in which way, through which character. And in this character, in this case, character is important because plot and character are usually tied up with one another. Because without a character, plot would not work. Characters move plots along because they do things or they don't do things. So each and every behavior, each and every um, action a character takes usually moves the plot along. So plot and character are inherently tied up with one another to a certain degree. When it comes to characters in plots, uh, one of the main foci is usually the protagonist. There are also co-protagonists and side characters as well as an antagonist, but again, we're not going to get into that. So if we look at plot structures, and again, I'm going to refer to some ominous essay critic that looks at why Marvel movies, for instance, don't work in the past five years because they don't really use the plot structure by Freitag or the three-act or five-act plot structure, which is usually the pro uh, plot structure um, you should be familiar with from school, potentially, hopefully still kind of familiar with. Um, it's this one. It's the triangular structure by Freitag. Usually plots can be broken down to a sequence of events or a sort of plot structure that looks like this. Um, again, there are three act structures uh, wherein, oh yeah, it's a bit slow. It's Tuesday morning. Technical equipment doesn't really work Tuesday mornings. But generally, we can break it down into a three-act structure or a five-act structure. Most of these stories we tell can be broken down to this schematic. Um, what happens, how it happens, and why it happens, though, that usually is genre-dependent. So a romance plot does have a resolution, but the resolution of a romance plot might be a very different resolution than the one of a horror plot, where in a horror movie, for instance, people will die, um, at this point, and no one survives, for instance, in a romance movie, you don't want, have, you don't want to have you know, a lot of dead people, but you want to have a happy ending in the end, so the resolution looks different. Also, how we get there is different, even though the terminology we use to describe these things is usually the same. So what we start off with is often the exposition. This is where uh, movie critics have been very clear that exposition doesn't mean that you start with a voiceover narration. These are the characters, this is how they are, this is what they do in the following, but this is where showing instead of telling is often more important. Um, from the exposition we have an inciting incident that is usually the point where characters, the protagonist is sort of moved along. This is the incident that starts the story to at a certain point in the story, or that starts of the main story as a whole. Then we have a rising action where tensions are sort of rising that comes to a complication where something happens that makes it even more difficult for the protagonist to succeed. We have the climax. If you have an antagonist, this is usually the fight between the protagonist and the antagonist. Uh, we have a reversal falling action and the resolution where all the uh, sort of narrative ties and narrative threats are tied in with one another and are resolved in the end. Um, 
Looking at the Harry Potter, and I'm just going to look at the Philosopher's Stone in this case as an example. Um, again, we have Harry Potter. Um, if you, and I hope you're all familiar with uh, the Philosopher's Stone, right? Okay, um, you're also kind of familiar with the terms right behind me, right? Okay, let's go through Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone together. What is the exposition part of the novel? And I'm obviously talking to the hardcore Harry Potter fans here. Sorry about that. Yes? Um, for one, the um, prologue. Uh, yeah. Yeah, when Harry wakes up and makes the um, bread first, and when I'm going to also what happens in the zoo, that's also still exposition of my opinion. Yeah. So everything that happens before he receives his letter, everything that happens in the Dursley home, that is usually the exposition, where, uh, where Harry is established as a character. He's kind of sassy. He usually um, he dislikes the Dursleys. The Dursleys are characterized. So the scene is, so to speak, set for the progression of um, the story. What's the inciting incident that gets, every, you know, that gets the ball rolling, so to speak? Yep. And then he's accepted yes, absolutely. So the letters and the acceptance into Hogwarts, this is what gets the ball rolling. Um, <laughs> rolling, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> bad puns will be accumulated in this um, lecture. But generally, this is sort of um, what gets the story going in this case. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone would be a completely different story if Harry had never received the letters and had not been accepted into Hogwarts. Okay. Rising action, what could be comprised under rising action? Yeah. When Harry um, picks him up from the island and then takes him again to watch in his um, owl and all the spies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what else? Or may maybe let's, let's um, yes, first. Yes, yes, okay, yeah. There are loads of complications in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, to be fair. Um, maybe a different question, what is the climax of the story? So um, just, you know, disclaimer, that looks like it's, you know, there is equal parts to each of these kinds of terms. It's not. Usually it's really skewered, so the climax usually happens not in the middle of a story. Often it doesn't happen in the middle of the story, but often somewhat near the end. So the last two acts or the last act is usually very short. So what's the climax of, of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? Charlie. I guess when Harry goes and, um, like, uh, when they leave Riddles and Harry has met Yeah, the confrontation with Voldemort in some case would be um, the climax because is, this is where antagonist and protagonist meet meet for the first time. I mean, at least one of them remembers the other, perhaps does not. Um, but generally, that is the, the where tensions come to a head, so to speak. So everything that comes beforehand is simply kind of still rising action. So in Harry Potter, it's everything from the train ride to meeting Ron and Hermione to um, seeing Fluffy to kind of figuring out that, oh my god, Hagrid has told potentially Snape um, that, you know, the Philosopher's Stone is at Hogwarts and how to get to it. Um, and then, of course, Harry, Ron, and Hermione race to find Dumbledore because they need the resolution that Dumbledore will resolve this problem for them, which is where they meet the complication because it's not as easy as that because Dumbledore is, of course, as usual, absent, um, which he is most of the time for all novels. Quelle surprise. Um, but then again, the climax is that did you just realize that it's 404 Dumbledore not found? Okay. Um, the climax is, of course, Harry and uh, Voldemort battle. They, mostly they monologue at each other. 
Voldemort monologues, but generally that is the climax of the story um, when sort of when everything else afterwards is just part of the falling action and the resolution. So the reversal that everything actually works and that Harry will survive is uh, in some form that the Philosopher's Stone is eventually also destroyed and Harry is saved by love. Um, I can't do that without sounding very sarcastic, but that is still the stupidest explanation why someone survives. Anyway, but this is the reversal, so everything kind of returns to a status quo. You know, safety is restored to Hogwarts in huge inverted commas, but generally that is it. And we begin the falling action to a certain degree. That is the train ride home. Gryffindor wins the, the cup, et cetera, et cetera. And after that, we of course end sort of in the muggle world. We end up back at the Dursley home. And this is the Dursley home in this case also functions as a frame narrative. We start off there and we end up there in the end. So the hero sort of returns home, but he's not unchanged by the events that have happened in between these two points. Are there any questions? Okay, that does not seem to be the case. Again, this is an idealized plot structure. Most stories can be broken down to it, but what happens, how it happens, is usually a bit different uh, depending on the genre, which and we're moving fast, so if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me before I steamroll all of you with a lot. So, which means we're moving on to narration and narrative situation. So the question we need to ask ourselves, or there are a couple of questions we need to ask ourselves when we look at narration. Namely, who tells the story? What kind of pronouns are used? So is it a he, a she, what not? Um, and third of all, is where is the narr narr um, narrator placed? So is he or she part of the story or is he or she not part of the story? So there are a couple of things that sort of um, are part of this, of this sort of talking about narrators and the narrative situation. So just to frame it in a more um, complicated way, I'm not quite sure, easier and complicated. Um, and I can see someone go, Oh God, what? So usually stories have different textual levels. Um, generally enough, and this is something I'm going to say generally, is what you need is the extra diegesis and the diegesis. This is the diegesis is the level of the story itself. So Harry Potter and the, for instance, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows is the diegesis. This is the story that happens. Hypodiegesis is usually a story within a story. So when Hermione, I think it is, reads out the tales of Beetle the Bard, that would be hypo uh, diegesis, a story within the story told by the characters in the story. So that's not told by a narrator, but by Hermione, who is part of the story itself. Hypo diegesis is usually this sort of in-between kind of point um, <clears throat> that is usually a frame tale, for instance. Again, if we look at Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, everything that happens in the Dursley home might be seen as a hyperdiegesis, but it's usually not. A different example would be if you've seen the first Shrek movie, it starts with a narration of a fairy tale that is not necessarily told by one of the characters, but by a narrator. Um, but the, hy or the hyperdiegesis, the story outside of the story, would then be a fairy tale, for instance, about a princess, etc., etc. Whether that has a relation to the story or not is generally um, not necessarily as important. And extra diegesis is extra outside diegesis the narration, so everything that happens in this part is outside of the story. And this is usually where, um, you know, as, as some of these scholars say, this is where the narrator resides, but this is not always the case. So, um, Cue in for a bit more vagueness in this case. So, but usually extra diegesis is where authorial narration, but also the figural, to, uh, figural, figural narrative situation happens. So the narrator is outside of the story. And this is where I'm going to refer to basically two kinds of 
uh, literary scholars, that is Gerard Genet and Franz Stanzel. And I'm going to mix them up a little, and I'm not going to ask you whether that's Genet or, or Stanzel, but you need to know the five terms that I'm going to introduce in the following. So again, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves when we talk about narration is, is the narrator, in this case, this weird little ghost, I'm not quite sure. I thought it was kind of neat, so I used it. Um, the question is, is he inside the story, or is he or she inside the story, or outside the story? So inside the story would be, again, he's part of the diegesis of the narration itself. That's a homo diegetic narrator. Is he, however, outside of the story and is just narrating it from the outside, telling us a story, then it would be a hetero diegetic narrator, someone who is outside of the story. And um, Jeanette basically has a sort of a scale from heterodiegetic to homodiegetic, which looks something like that. So again, heterodiegetic narrator and um, would be someone who is uninvolved in the story. If I were to tell you a story that happened to a friend, that would be a heterodiegetic narration. I'm not involved in the story. I'm usually telling it in a third person narration. I'm not involved whatsoever. I'm outside of that story to a certain degree, and I'm outside of the world, so to speak. However, the homodiegetic narrator is, can also be a first-person narrator, and if it is a first-person narrator, it's usually one that is very much involved in the story. He or she is generally involved in the story, but if he or she is also the protagonist of the story, then you would uh, talk about an autodiegetic narrator, someone who tells his own story or her own story to us, both involved in the story and telling us the story, usually as it progresses or um, at some point afterwards. So, and in between, there are certain, certain kind of other narrators that we can look at. They are sometimes involved in the story, and they are on a scale involved very much or less involved in the stories. Not going to uh, refer to that. I'm just putting it on the slide. If you're ever interested, you have the terms, but I'm not going to focus on these two terms or on these terms in the middle too much. The only thing I wanted to know is there is a difference between someone who is very much involved in the story and who, someone who is not involved in the story at all. Hetero and homo diegetic narrators. That's the only terms you need. Um, I mean, according to Jeanette, there are, of course, other terms you would need. There's also extra diegetic and intra diegetic in the story and in the world. But then it, this is usually the point where it gets really complicated. I think I'm quite sure that my tutors are doing something like that in the tutorial. Yes, they're nodding. Um, so I presume you will do that in more depth, but just for, for this lecture, what I want you to know is not so much intra and extra diegetic in this case, but certainly these two forms of narration and these two forms of uninvolved or involved na uh, narrator. Okay, so according to Jeanette, we have th these two kinds of involved or not involved narrator. The heterodiegetic narrator is um, on the extra diegetic level, so to speak. So he's outside of the world of the characters. And this is something you might be familiar with, and I've used the term beforehand. It's the authorial uh, narrative situation that Stanzel introduces. And you definitely know the terms because I, I'm pretty sure the German classes and the English classes um, in school still refer to that. Um, so behind me you can see both Stanzel's and um, uh, Jeanette's terms. Stanzel's terms should be something that is familiar to you, that is first-person narration, authorial narration, and figural narrative situation, that is ich erzähle Situation, auktoriale erzähle Situation, and personale um, erzähle Situation. All right, um, these terms are familiar to you, yes, no, maybe? Okay, most of you are nodding. Who has heard of them but has definitely forgotten what they are? Okay. <laughs> One honest person, <laughs> no, sorry. Um, okay, so we're going to go through each of them um, in a bit more detail with, as per usual, examples. Um, just as a, as a side note, I'm, I'm introducing both homodiegetic and heterodiegetic for a particular reason, because homodiegetic narration can be or is very similar to what Stanzel calls the um, first-person narration or first-person narrative situation. Usually, homodiegetic and autodiegetic narrators in particular start off with I am XYZ, 
I did this, this happened to me. So every time you have first person pronouns, you know it's not just a first person narration, but usually the narrator is homodiegetic, namely very much involved in the story he or she tells. Um, when it comes to the authorial narrative situation, we also have a concurrence in Jeanette's terms. That is the um, heterodiegetic narrator, someone who is not involved in the story and tells the story from the outside looking in. And of course, the figural narrative situation is a bit mixed, so we'll get to that a bit later. Uh, but that is usually something that is used in most novels. So you will find the figurative um, the figural narrative situation far more often, for instance, as you would find the first-person narration, for instance. Okay, moving on. First-person narration. Um, pretty simple. It is someone in the story who tells the story either to someone else or who sees everything that happens in the story. As an example, um, we could both... I think that's... Uh, yeah, that's Melville, so I did um, already refer to... Um, Moby Dick, so um, Moby Dick starts with, call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail around about a little and see the watery part of the world. So again, it is very, very obvious that we have a narrator who is involved or was involved at some point in the story he is going to tell and he is calling himself by his first name and then we have the first person pronouns in the text excerpt um, that indicates that this is a first person narration as well as a homodiegetic narrator um, involved in the story. In this case, it's even an autodiegetic narrator because Ishmael has... Um, not only been involved, but he has, he is also not only the narrating eye, but also the experiencing eye, at least at some point, he was. Um, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, all right. The second part, or the second sort of, um, the second narrative situation we're looking at is the authorial narrative situation that is, again, a heterodiegetic narrator, someone narrating a story from the outside to us. Um, one of the examples, and in this case this is Hemingway, um, is a narrator that is also a covered narrator, so we don't have someone who tells us the story, but who is implicitly telling us the story. The marvelous thing is that it's painless, he said. That's how you know when it starts. Is it really? Absolutely. I'm awfully sorry about the odor, though. That must bother you. Don't. Please don't. Look at them, he said. Now... It is sight or it is scent that brings them like that. So we don't know much what's happening in this excerpt, but we know that there is a narrator that's not necessarily easily explicitly defined. How do we know? Because we have he said twice. Yeah, we have he said twice. So there is a narrator that tells or that retells this dialogue to a certain degree and who characterizes or at least shows us what the characters in this narrative are doing. Um, a bit more obvious, perhaps, is sorry, this example that is from Fielding, and in this case he writes, Reader, I think proper, before we proceed any farther together to, re, uh, to acquaint thee that I intend to digress. It's always good. This is how I should start my lectures. So I will digress. But anyway, but um, the reader in this case, or the nar narrator in this case, which is, again, side note, even authorial narration does not necessarily have to be in third person, um, from a third person perspective, but it can. So I can tell a personal story, or I as a narrator can tell a story about something where I know everything about, but I can still use uh, the first person pronoun. So in this case, we still have an authorial narrator who discresses, who has side notes, who um, has emphatic nose, for instance, that he or she is sprinkling in, someone who is evaluating characters, someone who is able to see everything that happens in a story. So authorial narrative situation simply means that the narrator is omnipotent and omnipresent. There is nothing the narrator doesn't know. He or she sees it all, he or she knows it all, which is usually 
um, connected to narrators that are very reliable. But again, we should be careful with that because even though the narrator sees it all, he or she might choose to omit certain details, might choose to focus on others, might choose to focus on certain characters in particular. But general, it's the general overview, some kind of godlike perspective on what happens in the, on the um, diegetic level in this case. So again, um, this narrator in Fielding's novel does know it all. He is an authorial and first person narrator who mediates between the world of the characters and the world of the readers in this case. He is a heterodiegetic narrator, or she is a heterodiegetic narrator, someone who is not part of the story but who tells us about it. Um, which brings us to the last um, sort of narrative situation that I've already um, touched upon, that is the figural narrative situation, the personal Erzählsituation. Um, that means that the narrator is still kind of outside of it, um, again, I'm referring back to Pride and Prejudice. The narrator is heterodiegetic, not part of the story, not involved in it, but the story is being told through the perspective of one particular character. And I've shown you a different example already that is from Harry Potter. So Harry Potter obviously has a narrator. Um, the narrator is not involved in the story. He or she just tells us about Harry's adventures, and these adventures are being told through the eyes of Harry. Everything Harry experiences, we experience alongside him. So in this excerpt, Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. So far, so good. Come your hair, he barked by way of morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together. But it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. And this is where we finally, this is still very much a heterodiegetic narration, but this is where we also, in a moment, will see the personal sort of touch to it and the dual voice that I've spoken about. <laughs> Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick, fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Um, again, the narrator... Uh, sort of simply sets the scene, you know, where we are at, what is happening. Harry, he uh, is described from the outside to a certain degree. And in the last line, in a way, we have a switch. Because while Petunia said Dudley looks like a, uh, like a baby angel, still very much on the outside, suddenly the perspective switches to Harry's thoughts. Because this is an evaluative statement. Dudley looks like a pig in a wig. And this is Harry's thoughts. This is not Petunia's thoughts or Vernon's thoughts or the narrator's thoughts, but this is the voice of Harry Potter himself. So this is what I meant with dual voice, just to get back to that sort of question. We have the narrator who tells us and who sets the scene and who describes, but then we have a perspective switch where we see certain characters through the eyes of uh, Harry. And we see that even beforehand, more implicitly, when it's a fat hat and a thick blonde hair and what. So all of these, these descriptions are in, a, in some way evaluative. They are not necessarily neutral terms you would use to describe someone. But this is, again, already Harry's thoughts about Dudley. It is Harry's evaluation of Dudley that implicitly is part of his description. And this is what I mean when the dual voice means that sometimes narrator and character's voices mix. We have a hard time separating who is the narrator and who is the character and which parts and which sort of perspectives are the narrator's perspectives and Harry's. And this is what we see, especially in the last line, where Harry is, uh, speaks in a way explicitly to a certain degree. Um, and because I'm sort of rambling on and saying, you know, it's, it's from the perspective of a certain character, I'm just going to give you the, uh, the narrative situation. This is a figural narrative situation, so third person narration. Character is part of the world and the readers have a direct insight into the character. So um, the comment, Dudley looked like a pig in the wig, says much more about Harry than it says about Dudley in this case. Um, and the uh, narrator is a homodiegetic narrator in this case, if it's from Harry's perspective. So if Harry is the narrator, then this is 
a homodiegetic narrator because Harry is part, well, obviously part of his own story. Um, which kind of also brings us, because of the mixing, to the question of focalization. So the question we need to ask about narration is not only who speaks, but who sees. Who is, yeah. in the sense of do you have more than one narrator or more than one character that narrates a story? I think it would be the same thing like Dark. Dark is told, it's the same story told from various perspectives. This is exactly what we're talking about. This is focalization. The narrator stays roughly the same. You know, we see kind of everything, but we see it through one character's perspective. So the narrator stays kind of the same, but the characters through whose eyes we see the story or through whose perspective we see the story, they change. And this is called focalization. So narration is who speaks, Someone speaks, he said. So this is a sort of a distant narrator. But if we say, you know what, this character, we see the story and experience the story alongside this and that character, then this is focalization, the question, who sees? Whose perspective is taken in this very excerpt or in, in this story? It can be taken, and it's not, it's not fixed. Focal, focalization does not necessarily have to be one character. It can be 15 characters, it can be two characters. Uh, it can be no character or no discernible character to a certain degree. So this is when we, this is what we call, what, what we call literary scholars that we want to be, um, focalization. So focalization, again, it's, there's a difference between who speaks and who sees. So who speaks does not necessarily have to be who sees, and who sees does not necessarily have to be the one that speaks. Um, that is usually easy to represent in film if you, um, probably an example you haven't seen. So if you, for instance, think of certain films where you see um, a full shot of a street and then the camera narrows it down to one character and then suddenly you see it through the eyes of the character, that would be a focalization. First, you see everything and then suddenly you see everything from the perspective of one character in particular. If you think of ego shooter games, that is, you know, focalization of one particular character. You see it literally only through the eyes of one character. And because I've already mentioned e ego shooter, I'm not quite sure why I'm using that example, frankly, but bear with me on that front. Um, that means we only have one particular perspective that we take, and that perspective is usually limited. We also see that with Harry Potter. We see Harry Potter's world through the eyes of Harry Potter, which means that because Harry usually knows nothing about the world, we as a reader also know nothing about the world. If you read some of the scholarly work on Harry Potter, especially when it comes to questions of government and politics and cultural questions, then one of the more commonly referred to criticisms is that we know literally nothing about the government in Harry Potter. We know some of it, but we don't know everything, simply because Harry, on the one hand, probably doesn't care, but also because he's not involved in any kind of politics. So what we see of the wizarding world, so to speak, as a functional nation is incredibly limited simply because Harry is focused on very different things. He's also a teenager and usually teenagers, or at least teenagers in the 1990s potentially, weren't necessarily interested. I mean, wizarding teenagers in the 1990s were obviously not really interested in politics. So there is that. If we had the same story, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone from Dumbledore's perspective, the perspective would still be limited, but we would see different facets of it. So again, focalization also limits our point of view. It limits what we see, what we experience to a certain degree. Um, again, there are different kinds of focalizations, roughly three kinds of focalizations. That is internal focalization, external focalization, and zero focalization. Again, usually that's more easy to represent in film, but I'm also going to give you an example um, of internal focalization in a moment. So you can also, or that's also done um, <clears throat> in um, verbal form. So one of the internal focalizing, or one of the examples would be Virginia Woolf's flush. And in this case, I'm just going to read out parts of it. Uh, the, 
the internal of the focalizer um, is, or his, his experiences are described as such. What a variety of smells interwoven in subtle combination thrilled his nostrils. Strong smells of earth, sweet smells of flowers, nameless smells of leaf and bramble, sour smells um, and they as they crossed the road, pungent smells as they entered the bean or as and they entered bean fields. But suddenly down the wind came tearing a smell sharper, stronger, and more lacerating than any. A smell that ripped across his brain, stirring thousands' instincts, real, uh, releasing a million, a million memories. The smell of hair, of the smell of fox, off he fleshed uh, like a fish drawn in a rush through water further and further. And once, uh, at least the call was even more imperious. The hunting horn roused deeper instincts, summoned wilder and stronger emotions, and transcended memory and obliterated grass, trees, hair, rabbit, fox, in one wild shout of ecstasy. Love blazed her torch in his eyes. He heard the hunting, horns of, uh, the hunting horn of Venice. Before he was well out of his puppyhood, Flush was a father. So in this case, um, for most of this excerpt, we don't quite know who um, is experiencing the story. Um, and in this case, we have an internal focalization because we experience the world, this particular world, through the eyes, or in this case, the nose of a dog, which we only know about in the last... Um, line that, you know, out of puppyhood, Flash was a father, and in this case, puppyhood indicates that it's obviously a dog. And the dog cannot speak, so the narrator is obviously someone else. Um, that is, Flash was a father. This is told from the outside. It's a heterodigetic uh, narrator who tells us that Flash is a father, and he is out of puppyhood. But everything else beforehand is internalized, or is still a heterodigetic narrator, but an internal focalization, namely through the eyes of Flush himself. And Virginia Woolf switches that. So in this case, um, a narrative can have both internal and external focalization. So no narrative does only, or little narratives only do one thing or the other, but usually it's either fixed or variable. So if it's fixed, you stick with internal focalization and with one character in particular. Um, and if it's varied, well, it's, it's kind of what it says on the tin. It changes throughout the story. And this is what happens in Virginia Woolf's story, um, where the heterodiegetic narrator is eventually brought to the fore, and we have an external focalization on everything rather than through the eyes of one particular character. When uh, she writes, in this case, such conduct in a man, even, in the year of 1842 would have called for some excuse from a biographer. In a woman, no excuse would have been uh, um, availed. But the moral code of dogs, whether better or worse, is certainly different from ours, and there was nothing in Flush's conduct in this respect that requires a veil now. So, again, in this case, it's pretty obvious that it is a hydrodiegetic narrator. It's not the dog who tells us the story, but someone else. And that is indicated by the narrator saying, but the moral code of dogs, the moral code of someone else, um, is better or worse, and certainly different from ours. So the hydrodiegetic narrator has a different in-group, so to speak. He's outside of the narrative. He's looking from the outside in. And parts of the narrative are told through the eyes of the dog has, uh, himself in this case. That is external focalization. Clear so far? Any questions so far? Okay, next example. Far more confusing. No, um, just give me a second. Okay, so if we talk about, and I do have a couple of more examples of internal and external focalization, where you, for instance, and I'm just not going to read them out, but generally internal focalization is often made or emphasized by having, for instance, a first-person narration or by having um, a certain syntax that indicates a certain character. So if you have a story told from a child's perspective, sometimes the syntax will be sort of very simple, will use words that children would use, etc., etc. With the case of the dog, that's not so much the case, but generally um, you can see that if one story is really told and experienced through the eyes of one character, we have internal focalization. If it's told from the outside, we have an external focalization. Two examples that I'm not going to read out, but if you want to, you may do that um, 
in your own sort of, in your own leisure time, potentially. Okay, um, but there is of course a third part or a third term that is the zero focalization. And I did mention that beforehand. So this is an excerpt where you can see zero focalization or where you can sort of trace zero focalization. Zero focalization, even if it's called null focalisierung, does not mean that there is no sort of person through whose eyes we see that. It doesn't mean an absence of a perspective. It simply means that we cannot discern whose perspective we are taking. It could be someone else, it could be a third person, it could be whomever else, but that person is not a distinct character in the narrative. So in this case, we have the opening sequence of changing places that is uh, high, high above the North Pole on the first day of 1996, two professors of English literature approached each other at a combined velocity of 120,000 miles per hour. They were protected from the uh, thin, cold air by the pressurized cabins of two Boeing 707s and from the risk of collision by the prudent arrangement of the international air corridors. Although they had never met, the two men were known to each other by their names. So again, we don't quite know through whose eyes we see it because potentially no one would survive at that either uh, velocity or at that height, but this is null focalisierung, uh, yeah, zero focalization. We are not quite able to discern from whose perspective it's told. Um, so far, so good. Any questions concerning focalization and narrating, uh, narration? Yes. Well, good question. Um, in this case, it would be an internal focalization and the first person narration, sort of a di homo diegetic narrator, and it would be the dog even if dogs can't speak. But perhaps in this world um, in which the, this dog exists, dogs can speak. So it would be the story of a dog told by a dog. Um, if we go back to the, uh, the, the kind of um, the example with, with Flush, um, we see we have an internal um, sort of focalization. It's through the eyes of the dog, but it's not, it's, it's not, it doesn't say what a variety of smells I smelled. Then it would be internal focalization and first person narration told from the perspective of the dog and told by the dog. But because we don't have that, and because we have sort of the outside looking in before he was well out of his puppyhood, someone else says, that dog over there was well out of his puppyhood. This is why we have an hetero or a heterodiegetic narrator as well as internal focalization. There are different ways of mixing it up, but your example would be internal homodiegetic told from the dog's perspective by the dog herself. Yeah. Any other questions? Not quite sure whether we should focus on sto uh, stories told by dogs uh, from the dog's perspective, but um, if that's the example. <laughs> okay, no other questions so far. Which brings us to um, maybe the, the point of why am I looking at focalization and narrative. Again, there is a very brief summary at the end of the sort of complex topic of narration and focalization that I've put up there. So it's a very brief summary of what is focalization, what is narrative, or what is narration. But what is the point of focalization and nar narration to a certain degree? So the point, and sometimes, again, when it comes to, to literature studies or cultural studies, we have the, we are using this narrator, and this narrator has that effect. Right, so we use um, the first person narration, always a reliable narrator, and that creates the atmosphere or that creates the impression of. And this is true to a certain degree, but we shouldn't essentialize these ideas. So usually certain forms of narration and certain forms of focalization will create sympathy, will create distance, or will create nearness. So if you, for instance, um, 
if you read a story told from um, the antagonist's perspective, you might actually be sympathetic to the antagonist's plight, even though he is the antagonist and not the protagonist or not the hero to a certain degree. So having that creates and directs your sympathy into a certain direction. There's a question. Yes, there are. Um, generally, all narrators are unreliable. All characters are, to a certain degree, unreliable. Even those from the outside. So, um, 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 if if I use the the um, external focalize, or if I use the example from the beginning with the Miss Clack sort of narrating and sort of um, characterizing certain narrators. So it's always the what is omitted. Even external focalization omits certain things. Though there is always the impression, also with authorial narration, there's the impression that they know it all. That is, in huge inverted commas, external focalization and authorial narrative does not mean you know it all, because still our thoughts and everything we see is directed by a certain individual, by a certain narrator. So no matter whether it's authorial, even though we you usually tend to see that as a reliable narrator, it's not reliable. Because what we see and how the thoughts are framed, you know, think of Harry and the pig in the wig comment, if that's given by an authorial narrator, external focalization, there is still an evaluation part of this statement. It's a pig in a wig. It's not a neutral term. You wouldn't call someone else um, exactly this term. So there's a certain implication that already tells you that even if the um, narrator is perhaps reliable, he is not neutral or she is not neutral. And um, by choosing certain events, by omitting others, by flashing forward, backwards, focusing on certain characters, on certain events, this makes characters or narrators, focalizers, both reliable and unreliable. So I, I, I'm not quite, um, do you know the, the, the game Last of Us? And, okay, yeah, good. Um, kind of-ish. Google it if you don't know it. So this is, especially the, the second part, is told from two different perspectives. Um, you play as a certain character, but you see very different things. It's the same story, but you see it from two different perspectives. And it is not clear whether, it's, it's clear that both narrators in this case are unreliable um, and reliable in their own right. They see themselves as reliable narrators, but generally they are unreliable. So it's very difficult and you always have to trace the order of events, how language is used, what kinds of characters are focused on. That usually indicates um, reliability or unreliability to a certain degree. Although we should always doubt whether someone, you know, who tells us a story is not maybe choosing to only tell idealized parts of the story or to leave out things that are potentially negative as a characterization of the narrator, for instance. Okay, any other questions so far? That does not seem to be the case, which is why we're moving on to time, which is also what we are slowly running out of, but we still have five minutes, so um, <clears throat> time's running. Okay, time. There are different ways of representing time in a novel um, or in a narration, so to speak. Um, I'm just going to go through the main terms or the main terminology I, again, want you to know. And if you're asking yourself, is this clausur relevant? Then the answer is yes, this is clausur relevant. So usually stories are told in some form of order, whether it's chronological or anachronological, doesn't really matter. But usually stories look something like that. So they have a beginning, they have an ending, and beginnings are usually different, sort of there are different forms of beginning, um, which we'll go through in a moment, and there are different kinds of endings. But usually stories look like that. You have a beginning point, you have an end point, and then you go along. So you have a certain order of events, you have a certain timeline of events that is usually um, <clears throat> sort of represented in the narrative. Um, there are two kinds of story time, basically, or of time that we talk about when we talk about stories or narr uh, narratives. We have story time, that is the time that is told in the story. So the erzählte Zeit, if you want to have it in German. This is, for instance, the life of a person who's 84 years. This is the story that is being told. Um, 
Then there's a second kind of timeline which you see underneath and that is the discourse time that is the Erzählzeit. That is the time it needs to tell the story that can be longer or shorter. You know, a story time narration or a narration story time wise of one hour of a woman waiting for a bus to come can take four days to read or 90 minutes to watch. So the, disco the, the discourse time, the time it takes to consume this story can be longer or shorter than the uh, story time, so to speak. So again, the story of a woman waiting for one hour may take 90 minutes. But a story of, a, of the life of an 84-year-old who starts in, you know, with his birth and ends with somewhere before his death, because otherwise he probably couldn't tell the story, um, we would in assume that it doesn't take 84 years to tell. It would be terrible if it did. So usually the, the time, the, disc the discourse time, the time it takes to tell the story is shorter than that. might also take 90 minutes. So there is a discrepancy often between story time and discourse time. Um, again, and I think I'm starting with the beginning or with different kinds of beginnings. So there are different kinds or different ways of how to start a story. So you can start either in the beginning or you can start in the end or you can even start right in the middle of um, the story itself. So first we have the up ovo beginning. That is for instance this one and in this case it is literally usually starting really in the beginning of a story, usually with the birth of the protagonist. Um, if you read Tristram Shandy for instance, that starts and he proceeds to tell the story of his life and he never gets past one day but he needs I think 12 volumes to do so. Um, but he starts even before his birth with his conception and even in the, um, in the excerpt right behind me that starts in the beginning of the life of the protagonist. So my father's name, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I called myself Pip and came to be called Pip. I gave uh, Pirips as my father's family name on the authority of his tombstone and my sister, et cetera, et cetera. So what this character, Pip in this case, does, he starts really in the beginning of how and where does his family name and his name come from. So this is sort of starting in the beginning of his life, an up over beginning, starting literally in the beginning, or at the start of a life, or at the start of a story. So if you want to tell the story of a successful marriage, you would probably start with a wedding that would still be an up over beginning, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the birth, but it needs to be the beginning of the entire story, so to speak. Um, if you want to start in medias res, which means in the middle of a story, things have already been part or things have already been in motion. And if you've seen The Emperor's New Groove, then you know that the movie starts right in the middle of the story so, uh, to a certain degree. And there is a voiceover narration by Cusco in this case, where he narrates what's been or what's happening. And he basically says, will you look at that? Pretty pathetic, huh? Well, you'll never believe this, but that llama you're looking at was once a human being, and not just any human being. That guy was an emperor, a rich, powerful ball of charisma. Oh yeah, this is his story. Well, actually, it's my story. That's right, I'm that llama. I, my, the name's Cusco, Emperor Cusco. I was the world's nicest guy, and they ruined my life for no reason. Oh, is that hard to believe? Look, I tell you what. You go backward or back ways, you know, um, before I was the Lama, and this will make sense. This is in, in Medias Res. So the story has already been progressing to this point, and we're starting right in the middle of it. And now through flashbacks, the entire story is told. And this is done, it's really dark, you can't see half of this, but anyway. Um, but sort of Cusco goes on and says, rewind the clock, and he goes back to, all right, now see, that's a little too far back. Oh, look at me. So then he starts to kind of with this up over beginning, he starts literally at his birth or when he's still a child, but he tells the story of how he got to this place in the rain, in the jungle. He tells that through flashbacks. He says, we rewind the clock and start kind of in the beginning. And eventually during the narrative, we again end up in this place where he is in the jungle getting wet and getting rained on. Um, there's a third kind of beginning and that's the beginning at the end. Um, 
and called in Altimus Ray. So in this case, I've, I've taken an example which you might not be familiar with, that is the uh, series The Terror, and The Terror starts at the end. Most of, of the crime novels, if you look at Tatort, for instance, Tatort <laughs> usually starts with the death of someone, and the point of this ending and the point of telling a story from the end isn't so much what has happened, because we know what has happened in a Tart or um, movie, someone has been killed, but what's important is how does it happen? How do we get to this place? So um, if you look at dramas, analytical dramas are usually structured that way. They start basically with the resolution, with the death or the happy ending, and then the story is told from the, be from the end to the beginning. How did we get to this place? And this is what the terror does. So it opens with the translator and James Ross talking. At this point in the series, we have no idea what it is about. We have no idea who these people are. Um, but you already know from these uh, few lines that someone has died or that people aren't necessarily alive any longer. And we end this um, seen basically with James Ross or the narrator, uh, in this case the translator, telling us they have all died, they are dead and gone. And as a viewer, you might be wondering, okay, how did we get to this point? We know they're all dead, but how do they die? And this is what the next eight episodes, I believe, actually tell us. So they go through all of these situations that have led <coughs> to this ending. And this is, again, the in Artemis Ray's uh, uh, beginning, we are telling the story from the end to the beginning. Um, talking about beginnings and endings, the endings we see is usually a closed ending or an open ending. Closed endings, it, pretty much what it says on the tin, all of the narrative threads that are being opened up during the narrative are tied together in the end. Everything that has been opened is resolved. There is nothing left open to interpretation. You have one conclusion and one definite ending where everything is resolved. An open ending, however, kind of turns that on its head because the open ending says nothing is resolved. It opens up, for instance, alternative endings. So I think, um, uh, again, a David Lodge um, novel called Nice Work, it offers six different endings. So someone inherits money, but she also gets a job, but she also has a partner. So there are six different endings, how the story could actually go. And even every different ending sort of gives you like a cliffhanger where you could ask yourself, you know, what happens to the character afterwards. It's pretty much left up in the air what happens to this particular character. So open ending doesn't give you a definite conclusion, but it adds ambiguity to an ending. It leaves narrative threats open to a certain degree. And looking at the time, I think ending is indicative here and an operative word because we're already at the end of our session. So next week, we are going to be looking at the frequency and order of things, go back to Emperor's New Groove, and then um, have a look at the rest of history in this case. So see you next week. Have a good week. Um, yeah.